So yeah, the webinar today is is all about um, pig nutrition. Um, so we've just had some nice introductions there. Um, but yeah, my name is Shan Southwell and my colleague Andrew um, Marriage um, we will be doing the webinar today. So um, we've got an agenda together. Um, we are we will be looking um, and talking to you about where we work um, for farmers, just a bit of background, and then looking at the requirements um, in, in particular, the sows and gilts, uh, the piglets, and the grower and finisher stages. We'll then be going through um, the daily feed guidelines, um, that this in particular with feed intakes and, and how much would be provided. And then moving on to the water requirement. And then Andrew will be touching on the trace elements um, included in that feed. And then we'll be looking at the legislations and any use and any co-products associated with that. And then obviously at the end, um, it said that there's, a, there's an option for Q&A. So just to start off the webinar, um, we'll just talk to you a little bit about uh, the four farmers. So we have 10 compound feed mills um, ranging from Exeter all the way up to Penrith um, in Scotland. Um, our head office within the UK is based in Bury St Edmunds. Um, we are a total feed business, so we provide feed solutions to the monogastric division and the ruminant division. Um, the, the monogastric is pig, poultry, and what we call leisure, um, which is the game and the pet side. And then on the ruminant side, it's the beef, dairy, and sheep. Um, and we are an international company. Um, we operate in Poland, Germany, Belgium, um, and the UK, and then our headquarters is in the Netherlands. And the blue spots on the on the map there indicate where our feed mills are situated. And um, within that, within those, we share our innovation and our efficiencies um, around these countries, and we're able then to bring them to to the feed industry. So this leads nicely on to our nutritional innovation centre, so our research facility within Holland, um, that drives cutting edge research and feed innovation through our through, through this research facility, and then we are able to cascade it down to our countries. So that's that's about four farmers there. So um, you, you may have seen a triangle similar to this before. Um, basically, um, in, in, in simpler ways, it's, it's, ba it's indica indicating that three factors um, that, that, that fall within the pig, within the pig um, life cycle. Um, if, these, if these three factors um, work hand in hand, then um, you'll be able to achieve a, um, an, a, an optimum growing um, fit animal uh, for the purpose of your farm. So these three factors are um, the environment, so that's the housing, the indoor-outdoor system, um, the cleanliness of this um, environment, so ensuring that no bad bacteria causes disease, um, and the lighting, the vent and the ventilation. There's just examples, and then the health set, and then the, the the health factor there is the health status of the pig, so the disease that could that could suppress the lifetime performance of the pig, and then the, the nutrition there is the one that we'll be speaking about today, which is the feed solution um, for the pigs at different life different life stages of, of, of the animal. Right, so when we feed a pig, um, we're trying to meet the pig's needs for its requirements for maintenance. That's just staying alive day to day. Growth, which is obviously a very important part of a um, pig, rapidly growing animal. Uh, reproduction, as you're well aware, a sow is an extremely um, profligate animal that can, can reproduce a large number of um, piglets. Um, so there's a plenty of feed demand there. Lactation, when the sow's suckling all those piglets, and um, other functions like um, uh, service and so on. So our feed needs to meet all those different needs. And we tend to do that uh, with slightly different rations for pigs at different stages. Um, but all of those rations will comprise the same sort of six general classes of, of ingredient that pigs require. And so those, those, those ingredients, those, those classes are um, listed here as carbohydrates. So that's uh, cereals. Uh, in the UK, you're really looking at uh, barley and wheat in pig diets. Um, occasionally you might see some other, some other cereals like oats. And at the moment, there's a lot of interest in rye. Um, carbohydrates provide uh, mainly providing energy in a ration, but also a good protein contribution as well. 
Um, we provide further energy in a more concentrated form through fats. That's vegetable oils, uh, typically uh, soy oil. Uh, and then the uh, to drive growth and so on, protein is a vital part of any feed. And protein's uh, ingredients are mainly soybean meal uh, and then alternative proteins such as rape meal, uh, wheat feed uh, is a source of protein and fiber. Uh, wheat, wheat feed is famine as byproduct. It's, a, it's the term we use for um, what you might think of as bran. Uh, and then we top up proteins with their component parts, which are amino acids. We add synthetic amino acids to diets to um, get exactly the correct proportions of amino acids to uh, meet, meet the requirements of the pig. And then the final feed category, uh, which uh, features in all diets are minerals, vitamins, and trace elements. So the minerals, we're talking about things like salt and limestone to provide calcium, vitamins, uh, all good pig compound diets will have supplementary vitamins in. And, um, and then of course, uh, vital trace elements, uh, which we'll talk about in a little more detail at the end. And then the, the final requirement uh, of the pig is, of course, water. So provision of water is absolutely vital, uh, good, clean water and plenty of it. Uh, and, and so those all together can meet the requirements of the pig. And exactly what that pig requires, its optimum requirements are dependent on the, the life stage of the animal, but, partic but particularly its genetics and the environment it's in. Um, and to some extent, its health status. Um, uh, very fit, healthy animals or, uh, tend to um, put their uh, energy into growing, uh, whereas a, a disease-challenged animal will use more of its energy and a certain amount of amino acid in fighting disease. If we move on, Sean. So we'll move on now to look at different uh, classes of animals. So if we talk about nutrition of sows and gilts now, uh, sows require a different type of uh, feed requirement for their different life stages. Um, they require energy and nutrients for uh, maintaining themselves and then for recovery post um, suckling. Uh, they require additional energy um, for implantation of embryos and placental development at service. Uh, they require a little bit of energy for growing themselves and then also um, energy and nutrients for uh, growing piglets. And the way we meet all these needs, we would tend to do in sort of larger herds, commercial herds, we tend to do this through slightly different diets for different types of pigs. So you typically have a gestation diet or dry sow diet for the, 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 the pregnant sows, and then you'll have um, a lactation diet to feed, feed those sows that are suckling. Um, in, in, a, in, in a smaller system, you may not have um, be able to handle two different diets and so you can have one diet that's that will do all jobs and you pay more attention to the amount of feed that you feed so in lactation you feed higher amounts of feed and in gestation you feed lower and later on we'll touch on um, uh, those kind of feed amounts um, a little bit more precisely but um, you might typically if you're feeding a single diet to a sow um, You'll, you'll, you'll typically follow uh, our recommended pattern would be a, a regime of what we call high, low, high. So if we start at the point of weaning, um, between weaning and service, we would tend to recommend feeding a high amount of feed, almost feed ad lib at that stage. Um, there's uh, additional uh, energy and protein at that stage tends to assist um, the cell's fertility and the sort of hormonal release and so on to ensure successful service. Uh, it's also important at that stage if the sow has just been suckling, she may have lost a little condition, so it's very important to restore condition at that stage. Uh, and then we'll tend to cut feed down, um, sort of say two or three weeks after service, you'll tend to reduce feed amounts and just feed a, a sort of steady amount of feed throughout most of the gestation period. Um, and the important thing there is to um, maintain the sow and its growing um, litter, but not to allow the sow to get too fat. Uh, and then towards the end of uh, the gestation period at about day 90, uh, um, we would then look to possibly increase feed again um, to help feed that um, 
uh, fetal growth at the, at the very end of gestation there's a quite a rapid increase in fetal growth of the, of the piglets inside the cell and then um, when after the, 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 the cell will naturally not eat a lot around um, farrowing but shortly after farrowing as she starts suckling the piglets and producing more and more milk as that milk demand goes up as the piglets grow then you need to meet that uh, need with increasing feed amounts uh, throughout the lactation period. Um, but the biggest, uh, the, the main driver for how you manage your cell feeding is really uh, responding to cell condition. So we'll just move on to the next slide. Uh, and this, this is a little diagram which uh, shows us the range of cell condition. And, and there's actually a, a method whereby you can score cell condition according to this table. Um, you, you, you don't want your cells to be too thin. Um, and you definitely don't want to be too fat either. It's, it's very easy to think, oh, I'll have a nice big fat cell. She's fit and healthy and is going to do well. But, uh, but actually a fat cell will tend to have issues at farrowing, uh, won't be able to farrow big litters as successfully. And also, uh, crucially, uh, if a sow's too fat, she'll tend not to develop the appetite that she needs during lactation, during that suckling period, to eat enough food to suck on the piglets. So actually, you can get into a downward spiral. If your sow gets too fat, she then doesn't eat enough um, in lactation. Uh, she can lose too much condition and then be hard to get into um, get in pig again next time around. So what you're trying to do with your sow feeding is to... Um, sort of maintain your sow in this sort of middle number three position of a, um, a sort of well covered sow, not, not able to see the spine just poking out the back of the sow, not able to see the bones too much, but equally not too fat, not too rounded. Um, if some, some sows um, you know, will lose condition, particularly if they've had a very big litter or uh, reared some really, really strong uh, piglets and and that, that's when you need to pay attention to that uh, shortly after weaning to increase feed amounts and maintain a higher feed amount maybe for a bit longer to restore that condition. And then as you restore it, you then be, bring the feed back a little bit. Uh, when you're feeding cells in, um, at the other end in lactation, you, you gradually build the feed up. It's important not to, uh, if, you, if, you, if you just give the cell too much feed, um, they can then to suddenly go off their feed, they'll sort of gorge and then and then give, give up eating, which you don't want. So you sort of need to keep them keen a little bit, but equally build that feed up each day, add a kilo a day or so on. But Sean will come on to that um, a little later. So if we um, if we now move on to uh, piglets, Sean. Yeah, so, um, so from obviously sows and gilts, uh, you know, come piglets. So feeding that, the sow and the gilt can have a great impact on the piglets viability, its development, and the piglet's birth weight and the variation there. Um, so therefore, a requirement to be able to get that up with the feed levels right at, at the cell stage is essential for, to, to, to enable better piglet viability and to ensure lifetime performance. But as we all know, um, piglets do require good quality colostrum from the cell of the gilt um, and enable to get the piglets um, at their starting line. So this can be achieved and helped by effective uh, gestational lactation diets, as touched on before, um, to ensure maximum output of colostrum and milk can be consumed and given. So the colostrum um, contains hemoglobulins. These hemoglobulins can help build up um, immunity within the piglet, and it, it is essential for the piglet to ensure that they've had enough colostrum within the first um, within the first stage of their life after, after birth. But not only that, not only that, when they when they consume colostrum, it actually enables optimum thermoregulation, as as the temperature in utero um, compared to outside drops drops drastically, and it needs to, we need to ensure that we are building up that the the the, the, um, the, the thermoregulation there post birth. So dependent on on the weaning period and your system, providing the piglets with solid feed from an early age pre weaning when they are with their mother, will help condition their gut for post-weaning life and, and when milk, milk will not be available. So this can be through a specific creep feed, um, a creep feed regime, um, and, it, it, but it can all, and, it, and the regime can be dependent on the feed um, after, after, the, after the creep feed. Or it can also be, piglets can also be um, 
eating the sow, uh, the sow feed that's been provided, um, which usually is the case in, in an outdoor unit um, that doesn't particularly have creep feeds, which is which is okay to do to um, to ensure that they are getting the solid feed with, um, into them and enabling that gut condition. So you're probably thinking why there is a Formula One car on the piglet um, slide. Um, but a good analogy that I, I tend to use is that a Formula One car requires high octane fuel. Um, if, if the car has conditions favourable to them um, and doesn't run out of, of fuel and no mechanical issues, then the prediction there is that the, 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 Formula, One, the Formula One car will have the best start and also win the race. Now the same goes, goes with piglets. If they get the colostrum and milk and they get the best start in life, um, and uh, that pr provided solid feed, then the, the, the piglets that, pr that, get, that get this will, will ensure um, that they will grow fast and efficient right up to slaughter. So we'll now move on to um, nutrition around uh, and feeding around growers and finishers. So we're talking um, about uh, sort of two, three weeks post weaning, um, uh, through through to um, a, fi a finished animal at sort of anywhere between um, eight, eight, 80 to 115, 120 kilos um, uh, dead weight. Um, sorry, live weight, live weight. Um, so um, we'll tend to feed modern pigs, you tend to feed them ad lib throughout this period now. Um, modern commercial uh, pigs will grow um, fairly rapidly um, through this period you know they might do over that period they might do seven eight nine hundred grams um, of uh, body weight gain a day um, more traditional breeds will obviously grow more slowly um, but nevertheless the principle remains the same uh, it is possible with more traditional breeds that um, that are, that are genetically going to lay down more fat that you may be, you might be tempted to sort of restrict their feed slightly to prevent them getting too fat. It depends on what sort of animal you're trying to produce for what, for what your market is really. But um, the grower and finisher feeds um, are um, uh, tend to vary in the uh, grower feeds. You're starting off with a small animal with a relatively low feed intake. Uh, so you tend to start with a higher density ration. So it's a more nutrient dense ration with per kilo of feed. It has more energy and more protein, more amino acids in it. Um, and uh, in this little table here, you can see a sort of early grower diet might have a crude protein of around about 19%, something of that order, uh, or a total lysine of about 1.4, 1.45. And then as the pig grows and gets bigger, you change the consumption increases, the daily consumption, the animal increases, and you tend to bring down the density of the ration. And so you can see here in the table how you move through towards a finisher diet, which will be um, uh, yeah, sort of nine and a half uh, net energy and, and, and about 15 to 16 crude protein. Um, that, that would be a typical sort of uh, feeding program, but um, it may not be practical to have three rations and certainly plenty of people will feed two over that phase and you can even feed one. Um, if, if you're going to feed one, I would tend to sort of tend towards the uh, a higher density ration. Um, you do need to be mindful of copper, which we'll, we'll come to in a moment, that uh, early grower and grower rations have high copper levels. You can see the 100 illustrated there. Whereas finisher rations have a copper level of 25. If you're gonna, if you those are legal maximum. So if, if you're gonna finish pigs on one ration, you really do need to have a low a low copper ration uh, to take them all the way through. Um, if, if you're gonna just have one ration, so that's just one thing to be aware of. Um, if we uh, move on now, so yeah, I think so Sean, you're gonna cover this, aren't you? Sorry, Sean again. You carry on, Sean. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is just general feed requirements or guidelines, but as said before, factors that can affect um, their feed intake and how much they should be provided, such as the genetics, and how much they can eat, such as the feeder space, the density and the palatability of, the, of this diet, and also their health status and the environment they are in. So the, these feed requirements are just based on guidelines. Um, as a general rule of thumb, we're able to 
provide some pointers um, in the right direction of how much feed intake um, or how much feed should be provided at different stages of their life cycle. So just to start off then, the, the dry cells, um, the gestation, um, gestation period in the gilts, they require a 2.5 um, kilogram per day of a sow in a gilt diet. Um, the, one week before, uh, before service um, for gilts and sows is to provide an extra one kilogram per day and one week after the service. Um, now with lactating sows, there's a huge demand on the lactating sow with, with, with milk let down um, and also um, ensuring that the, the, the condition of the sow um, after birth um, is effectively recovered. Um, so providing, providing for lactating sows is 2.5 to 3 kilos a day, um, but within that gradually increasing per day by around 0 0.5 kilos um, whilst the piglet is still with the mother to um, feed into their appetite and ensuring that their appetite is met um, pre-weaning. Um, in terms of boars, the boars can be fed the, the sow feed. Um, boars can be fed around 2 kilograms per day. Um, now, if the boar is regularly used, um, then you can increase this to a 2.5 kilogram per day. Um, now, with the boars, you want, you want to also maintain con that condition and the maximum output of fertility. Um, so you are so, so um, you feeding feed, feeding the, the boar to two to 2.5 kilograms should be able to should be should, should enable this. With the piglets, um, so depending on your on your weaning age. Um, you pr provide the creep feed um, ad lib, um, little and often is the general rule of thumb. Now, if the if the piglet is weaned later, obviously these piglets can be fed a sow and weaner diet um, or the sow diet, which will enable them to engage interest um, and then copy their mothers by by eating it. So um, this will be fed when when the sows are fed. Um, in terms of the growing and finishing pigs. Um, this is highly dependent on the, the breed um, and the genetics of the pigs. So in more commercial herds, um, you'll find that the, these pigs or this stage of their, of their life, they're fed ad, ad lib. Um, so fed to appetite to ensure that efficient growth to slaughter. Now, if you've got more rare breeds, um, th this in particular, there's a precaution there to, to, to ensure that we, we don't lay too much too much, lay, lay down too much fat. So restricting the feed intake on there would be would be essential. Um, so a, a general guideline for that would be around 2.5 kilograms per day um, um, is, is, is kind of a, a requirement or a guideline there. Um, so that's that's daily um, some feed requirements. So we'll move on um, to water as a requirement. Um, now, water is a key ingredient for everyone and every organism, um, and this is in particular for pigs. Um, it is required for various reasons, um, but one's in particular is adjusting their body temperature, um, transporting the nutrients to their body tissues, um, promoting the production of the milk, and, um, and, con and can contribute heavily to the growth and reproduction um, of the pig. Now, when an animal is sick, um, this can be a clear indication and can be re reflected in its water intake um, and therefore a cl clear indication of the health status of the pig. Now water should be clean, tested with the flow rates tested too, um, it, it, to ensure that the, the pigs are getting what they required. And water should be, um, should be provided to them at all times and not restricted. Um, and this can obviously pr be provided through troughs or, or, or nipple drinkers um, and then provide enough space for them to, to get up the water. Now, as you can see from this table on the screen, um, this is water requirements at different life stages of the animal. Um, so for one to, be, to, to pick out really from, from the table is the lactating sows. So that's 25 to more than 50 litres per animal per day. Now, to be able to uh, meet the demand of that pig, um, for maximum output of, of, of milk. Water helps the production of milk. So it, it, if it's restricted, it not only affects the, the sow, but it also affects the piglets. Um, so, so water is a key ingredient for pigs to be able to be provided um, to, to ensure that the feed, the feed intakes are there as well. David, do you want to hear? Yeah, so I'm just going to touch on one or two trace elements now. 
Um, zinc is a trace element that's um, really important for um, different functions within the uh, health and um, production and, and, so on, and growth of the pig reproduction. Um, it's uh, limited, the amount that you can put in feed is limited by law, um, but uh, it's been possible or is possible to put uh, much higher levels of zinc in for therapeutic use uh, in, um, in piglet diets just post weaning. So uh, it's not uncommon that um, diets from sort of, if, if pigs are weaned at four weeks, sort of four to six weeks or, or, or just for sort of four to five weeks, might have a, a higher therapeutic level of zinc and um, we're just flagging up here that 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 um, has been uh, that will no longer be allowed under the latest uh, European regulations that are coming through so in 2022 um, the that option of using therapeutic zinc will no longer be there it has been that uh, therapeutic zinc has been very very effective in controlling post weaning diarrhea and um, such things as bowel edema disease. So um, if, if, if you were using um, high levels of zinc, um, you need to be thinking about how you're gonna cope uh, beyond 2022. Um, you, you, you can uh, look at um, taking it out and, and thinking about um, other ways that you can reduce stress at weaning, uh, looking at uh, water treatment, looking uh, really closely at the whole kind of weaning process and how you can um, make make that uh, better for the pig and you might find that you could you, you you thrive without high levels of zinc uh, there are some people that uh, get on perfectly well without zinc by no means everybody uses high levels of zinc so um, that, but that is a change in legislation that's coming up on the horizon um, iron uh, iron's another um, key trace element um, to um, help control disease and maintain health and growth in piglets um, it uh, obviously it, 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 it uh, also required for hemoglobin production, which um, helps the carrying capacity of um, oxygen in the blood. Um, sow's milk is actually deficient in iron, and so it's important that a piglet has um, access to an alternative source of iron. Pigs outdoors will, through rooting, um, pick up some iron, get enough iron from soil, and so on. But um, indoor piglets, uh, indoor pigs. Um, Piglets do need to be supplemented um, with iron, and that's usually done uh, orally uh, or, via, or, or injection. So that's just a point there to remember. And then finally, copper. Copper is another trace element um, which helps the uh, animal's immune system um, function properly and, and has a beneficial impact on growth and feed intake. So um, uh, higher copper diets, um, uh, pigs perform better on higher copper diets, but um, the maximum amount of copper that's allowed to be put in feed is controlled again by EU regulations. And um, in fact, um, within the last uh, year or two, um, the maximum copper levels have been reduced a little. Um, uh, their copper levels are lower in Europe than they are in elsewhere in the world. Um, and um, they've just been reduced, reduced again. But as I was just uh, repeating what I said earlier, it's important to note that um, uh, after eight weeks after weaning, you, you can't feed a higher level of copper. You've got to go down to this um, 25 level. Um, and so it's just important to ensure that if you're, the diet that you're finishing your pigs on is a finisher diet with low copper and not a grower diet with high copper. And I think that completes my section on trace elements. Uh, we'll now pass back to Sean, who's just going to touch on some legislation and some uh, aspects around um, shall we call it the sort of less conventional type of pig feeding? Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, so, yeah, so a, a little bit about um, feed legislation here. So after the, the sort of mouse disease in 2001, uh, new legislation came into force that banned any domestic kitchen waste or catering waste um, that's fed to pigs. Now, this is in particular um, meat, meat byproducts or products that have passed through um, the domestic or catering waste that has meat in it or contaminated with. Now this contaminated food can spread the, the, the viruses and the bacteria um, such as diseases like African swine fever that's obviously very prominent within the pig industry at the moment and therefore feeding these these um, these products can have can, um, is illegal and it's very important not to be able to, to feed these to your pigs. 
So you're probably asking, what, what can we, what can you feed um, your pigs? Um, so uh, in in regards to extra um, stuff you can feed to your pigs, so that's grains, um, fruits, and vegetables. Obviously, not that's not been passed through the domestic or catering waste. Um, liquid milk or colostrum that's produced on the same farm. Um, former foodstuffs such as melted fat, but that cannot be the main ingredient and has not been in contact with the domestic or catering waste. So if you don't know where the feed has gone to or whether it's been contaminated with any meat or meat byproducts, then it, it's not, it, it's obviously very illegal to, to do this to your pigs and shouldn't be fed um, to your pigs. So um, if that's the case, um, then your local supplier of feed will be able to, um, to provide the feed um, that's best formulated for, for the pig. Um, so in, in terms of using co-products from the human food and drink industry, um, so there might be a, a food, like a local, a local food company um, that's around the corner um, that can provide um, or supply waste food that's intended for use in the pig in the pig feed industry. Now, using these co-products such as surplus materials um, from the local local food company um, has to comply with the feed hygiene regulation. So, some examples of this is is the food and drink manufacturers supplying surplus material. Um, any retailers that supply surplus material for feed use, such as such as bakeries, that's uh, any bread waste um, that comes from that. Um, food manufacturers selling co-products, such as materials generated um, as part of the food manufacturing process. Um, you drink companies um, selling co-products, such as the brewers and distillers grains, and then any meats and fish um, processors supplying animal byproducts for the use in, in pet feed. Um, so that's obviously not the meats that's being um, passed through the domestic or catering waste. So a, a take home message really is to is to check that your supplier is, compl is, is complying if you're using co-products within um, your pig feed. But you have to ensure as well that you are meeting the pig requirements, um, nutritional requirements. So ensuring that you've got them six general classes of feed um, as using co-products comes with a level of variation within the nutrient value. Um, so that's so yeah so the, the take home message there really is, is check your your supplier is, is complying um so that's that's the presentation um yeah thank you for thank you for listening and i, I hope that was as informative um as, as possible and potentially i've got something out of it so Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Andrew and Chan. Yeah, uh, really interesting and yeah, very informative um, presentation. So yeah, we've had a, a couple of questions come in. So yeah, please send your questions in. Okay, yeah, cheers, Andrew. Sorry, we're running into some um, technical difficulties here, but um, I'm sure everything's fine now. Um, another question that's come in is, um, I see you recommend 1.1% lysine for growers. I have. Berkshires, where I finish outside in the summer and then partly open sheds in the winter. Is it the type of feed I should use or could I use something with a lower specification that would be cheaper? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, one, the 1.1 1 .1 lysine would be a relatively high density diet. I would have thought your Berkshires would um, probably do fine on a on a on a lower density they're they're, they're not genetically going to grow as quick as the modern breeds and so on so uh, yeah and um if you're just feeding one diet grow to fi finish you do need to be thinking about a finisher diet um i mean a sort of low density finisher diet would be 0.7 oh i'll well, say 0 0.8 0 0.9 total lysine um whereas um yeah 1.1 would be a sort of higher density finisher diet Okay, thank you. Um, I'm quite yeah, conscious of the time. So yeah, one more question before we wrap things up. Um, you mentioned the um, the ban of zinc. Um, what's yeah. the reason behind the ban? And can you recommend a supplement or a trace element that can be used in its place to um, reduce post weaning diarrhea? Um, uh, Sean, would you like to come on, come in on that one? 
Um, so zinc is, is, is the reason why um, the zinc um, has been changed from therapeutic levels down to the nutritional um, levels. It's due to the, to the environmental risks that um, zinc um, has um, from when uh, the, the pig um, kind of comes out of the back end um, into the environment um, and obviously that the risk that it has to the antibiotic re resistance. Um, in terms of what you can do differently um, in terms of post weaning diarrhea, it's really um, looking at the whole of that triangle that I spoke to you about, so the environment that it's in, the cleanliness, the, the management of them pigs. Um, and then also, you know, the post weaning diarrhea is ensuring that they're in, ensuring where they are um, is it, it, well is clean, like we've, we've pointed out, and that they've got the level of nutrition required. Um, so it, it, with, with with an alternative to zinc, um, I think obviously zinc is is great in what it, it what it does, um, and but it can still be can still be put into the to the feed at nutritional. Um, a, a total of 150 parts per million. So um, it can be, it, it, it will still be in there, which will obviously impact that post weaning diarrhea. So I hope that's, I hope that's answered your question. So yeah, yeah, there's, totally. there's no, there's no silver bullet for zinc, but there are a number of different things you can do to try and mitigate the effect of losing therapeutic zinc. So you know, making sure that the, try to encourage feed intake pre weaning, so to condition the gut at, um, at the piglet. Um, for when it's weaned and it might take on feed better. Um, uh, water acidification, uh, feed acidification possibly, um, various things. But it's, as Sean said, it's looking at the whole weaning process and doing everything you can to improve that for the piglet. Yeah, the whole triangle, as you mentioned. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I hope that's answered all the questions that's come in anyway. So, yeah, so once again, thank you, um, Andrew and Sean. Very, as I said before, very interesting, very informative um, webinar. I hope that everyone that's joined can take something away from tonight. And if anyone has any questions on anything, um, feel free to contact myself um, or Eileen from Ethermoch or anyone from Family Connect. And I'm sure um, you know, we'll be able, we'll be more than happy to answer your question. and. Yeah, and um, sort of your inquiry. So, any questions on anything we've covered tonight or any um, services that we have to offer, please contact um, Family Connect or Mental Mark mm -hmm. Cymru. Thank you very much, and, um, mm -hmm. and thank you all again um, for watching.